Thank you, Christine. That was beautiful. And thanks to all of our special music folks, Mary and our bell ringers, and uh, the people who are going to be singing. And uh, there's a couple of singing changes tonight, and one of those was uh, because Mary Franson is helping out her mom, Jeannie, and we'll include Jeannie in our prayers this evening. So Christmas Eve, it's great to be back after taking a too far a long time off, and, and I'm very thankful to have so many people here, and I know we have a lot of visitors, so blessings to you. The Christmas reading from Matthew 1 and Luke 2 is so familiar to many, they probably know it by heart, but you discover something new every time you look at it in earnest, and uh, tonight we're going to be actually talking about that topic, uh, Joseph's consideration. Uh, we're going to be doing some considering of uh, the text and his own mind tonight, and uh, hopefully figure out uh, how we can be better than he was initially, and as good as he was finally. So our uh, Advent wreath will be lit this evening by some gathering of the Terry family. There's a lot of them here, and I'm not sure which ones are going to be doing it, but we invite them forward uh, to light the Advent wreath. On Christmas Eve, the first advent of our Lord at the Nativity reveals what was true from the conception of Christ. By the Holy Spirit, Jesus was in the flesh, but not seen in the flesh until his birth. In a hymn attributed to St. Ambrose in the 4th century and adapted by Luther in the hymn, Savior of the Nations Come, wrote in verses 1 and 7, Savior of the Nations Come, Virgin Son, make here your home. Marvel now, O heaven and earth, that the Lord chose such a birth. From the manger newborn light shines in glory through the night. Darkness there no more resides, in this light faith now resides. Satan's defeat was certain since the first gospel in Genesis 3.15, that the seed of woman would crush the head of the serpent. Tonight we celebrate the advent of our Lord. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with, son, with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 7, 14. Now we've... We're going to light the candles Holy Father, only begotten Son, and Holy Spirit, in your mercy hear our prayer. This night we celebrate what was always true. You desire to be in fellowship with your creation, and specifically your faithful people. May we consider the many and various ways you have spoken to us through the prophets, and conclude boldly by the gift of faith that Christ is Emmanuel, God with us. Remove our struggles of faith by your clear word, May we rest in Christ, who is our Sabbath rest. Amen. Thank you all. Our opening hymn is Angels from the Realms of Glory, hymn 367. We sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Uh, the verses are printed in your bulletin.
please rise for the invocation. Tonight we will be following the order of service as it is printed in the bulletin. We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join with me as we open our hearts and minds and go to our Lord in the confession of sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I've ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, that poor sinful being. This is our confession. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the place and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we celebrate our forgiveness by singing on Christmas night, All Christians Sing. It's printed in the bulletin. This evening's psalm is Psalm 110. It's in your bulletin on page 3. We read it responsively. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Your people will volunteer freely on the day of your power in holy splendor. From the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as the dew. May the Lord be with you. With The uh, colic for the nativity of our Lord is at the bottom of page three in your bulletin. Please join with me as we pray this prayer together. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Savior and Emmanuel, we praise you for the wonder of Christmas. As we consider the miracle of the incarnation, remind us of the many scriptures of old, which foretold your coming into the flesh. May your word strengthen our faith and increase our wonder as we consider our own obscurity 
Help us to remember that he who numbers the hairs of our head has also woven us in our mother's womb. May we believe that Christ is coming indeed for us individually. We praise you at your nativity. In your name we pray. The first reading is from the Old Testament, Isaiah 7, 10 through 14. Then the Lord spoke to, again to Ahaz, saying, Ask for a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol, or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I put the Lord to the test. Then he said, Listen now, house of David, it is, is it too trivial a thing for you to try the patience of men? that you will try the patience of my God as well. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and she will name him Emmanuel. The epistle reading tonight is from 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, let's love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, because God is love. By this the love of God was revealed in us, that God has sent his only Son into the world so that may we live that we may live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, and we also ought to love one another, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we remain in him and he in us, because he has given to us his spirit. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him, and he in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. This is the word of the Lord. And please rise for the verse of the day and our gospel reading. In your bulletin on page 4, you will find the verse of the day, Matthew 1, verse 20. We gather our hearts and read this verse together. But when he had thought this over, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. gospel for the nativity of our Lord is recorded in Matthew chapter 1 beginning at the 18th verse. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, since he was a righteous man, did not want to disgrace her. He planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you shall name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." Now all this took place so that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet would be fulfilled. Behold, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, 
and they shall name him Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. This is the gospel of the Lord. And our sermon hymn is hymn 358, From Heaven Above to Earth I Come. We sing verses 1 through 4. You may be seated. Grace to you, that grace made manifest in the manger, and peace to you from the Prince of Peace, who comes to us in the most disarming and holy ways as a infant child and the child of a virgin. God would employ no prophet at all when he would speak the first Christmas prophecy. It would come from God himself. He was rebuking the rebellious angel Satan, foretelling his own future destruction, destruction by the seed of the very woman that he had deceived. The Lord God himself said, Eve's seed will crush your head. The living voice had spoken the first Christmas prophecy because God in Christ was that seed. Over and over again in the Old Testament, God told us more and more about Christmas and more and more about that seed. Eve would believe first that she would be the mother of the child. In fact, in the very next chapter, she is the one who says, I have begotten a man-child, the Lord. It wasn't by the Lord, it was the Lord is what she believed. Her theology was pretty good, but her timing was a bit too hopeful. She was not close to where the Messiah would be born. The fullness of time would come years later. But leading up to that, there would be other promises. So centuries after that first promise, there was another promise made to King David by the prophet Nathan this time. And the Lord gave Nathan the message to give to David, who was the giant slaying shepherd king himself. And he would say, in response to David's design to build a a temple for God, are you the one who should build me a house, the Lord said? I will make a house for you. And when your days are complete and you will lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your seed and I will establish his kingdom and he shall build me a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. You see, God needed both Joseph and Mary to be fully invested in this because they were both descended 
from King David. Joseph would give the inheritance of the throne, even though Jesus was a stepson or a foster child. He could do that. But Mary was the bloodline. So God would use both. About 300 years after that promise, as the earthly kingdom of Israel, north and south, already divided, already tottering, spiritually bankrupt, faced another giant of the Assyrian Empire, the Lord would remind him that there was even a bigger giant that he would slay. And he gave the promise that we had read tonight. A virgin will be with child and bear a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, God with us. A couple of chapters later, more on that child. The child will be born to us, and his name will be called Mighty God. One of Isaiah's contemporary prophets, Micah, also received a message from the Lord about that seed. He received a message about the location where he would be born and the eternal lordship of the seed. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me, who will be a ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. So finally, we arrive at tonight's Christmas gospel, seven centuries later, when Mary told Joseph that she was pregnant. Well, according to the text, she may not have actually told him. The text says she was found to be pregnant with Jesus. Joseph seemed not to immediately accept that this was the fulfillment of all of those Old Testament prophets. He didn't really believe that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Maybe he didn't go to synagogue enough as a child. Maybe he didn't hear those promises. Or maybe more likely he did hear and know those promises. And he had to wrestle with Christmas and said, it's too fantastic. It's too incomprehensible. And it's way too big to involve me and my little Mary. But if you truly consider Christmas, it becomes very personal. It invites you in to God's holy family. You may recall from the parallel gospel of Luke, we get additional details. In Luke's gospel, Mary immediately leaves after Gabriel has given her the promise that she will be the mother of the child. Probably at that moment, at the Annunciation, she does conceive the child by the Holy Spirit. She makes haste to see her relative Elizabeth, who would become the mother of John the Baptist, she was way beyond childbearing age, and yet she was six months pregnant with John the Baptist. Mary no doubt left in a hurry for at least a couple of reasons. One is she was just excited. I can't believe this wonderful promise. My relative Elizabeth has prayed and prayed and prayed and finally probably give up prayer, and now she's pregnant. But the other one was that in a small village, the people in your family unit no, especially when you are a young woman, when your menses is. And she didn't want people to start asking questions because they knew who was ceremonially unclean at that time, and what they would do would dictate that they were unclean. And so she wanted to get out of town as soon as possible so no one would know that. Maybe she was thinking, this miracle is way too far beyond explanation. I'm not even going to try. And so in her own passive way, it seems as though Mary was going to let the Lord work out the details. Now, I'm not so sure that that's faith, really great faith, or whether it's simply timidity and fear of confrontation. God doesn't answer that. And you know, that's okay. Because she was still faithful. It would tell us a lot if we knew all those details about when, what was said, and how it was said. It would help us in a way, I think, but God didn't tell us that. But there are some possibilities that are worth thinking about. Possibility A, Mary immediately tells Joseph about this wonderful promise of the angel Gabriel that she's going to be the mother of the Messiah, and it will be a virgin birth, and then leaves for the hill country where she meets Elizabeth. Another possibility is he doesn't know this because she omits that really important information about her own pregnancy and instead simply says, you're not going to believe it. 
I had a revelation from an angel that Elizabeth is pregnant, and finally she and Zacharias are going to have a baby, and I want to go see that baby. And that seems to be the way it plays out if you read the gospel. So she leaves. Three months later, she comes back a little bit pregnant. Well, you can't really be a little bit pregnant. But you can have the pregnancy be early in the stage and show it just a little. And probably that's the time that Joseph realized what had really happened. Mary says nothing about Gabriel's announcement. This is a variation on this, that last one. She leaves for three months, and then you may remember when she shows up without saying a word to Elizabeth, Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, says, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how is it that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Luke makes a point to say in the text, she said it loudly. So Mary was probably either thinking, well, thanks for letting the cat out of the bag. Or maybe she was thinking, praise be to God. He did communicate this miracle to Elizabeth, and maybe he'll do the same thing with Joseph. And it's also possible that somebody hearing that conversation, knowing that they were related to Joseph, ran down to Nazareth and said, Joseph, congratulations. You're going to be the father, or more accurately, the foster father of the Messiah. One way or another, Joseph found out. In God's wisdom, he didn't tell us how. What we do know is that however he found out, he came to the conclusion that he should not remain married to Mary. They were engaged, but in the Jewish culture, it was tantamount to marriage. And so jo Ma Matthew writes this beautiful and simple explanation of how it went down. Now, the birth of Jesus the Messiah was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, since he was a righteous man, did not want to disgrace her, but he planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, the word consider implies some deep thinking, some serious thought about this situation. We also get the companion word considerate. People who are considerate usually look at the big picture. They don't immediately respond to the thing right in front of them. They consider feelings of each other. They put others into the storyline, the storyline that may include them saying something or them saying nothing, them doing something or they may do nothing. And related to that, of course, are the consequences of their action or inaction as the person who is in the middle of knowing something the other does not know. And I believe the most considerate people, people of faith and specifically tonight on Christmas, people who are Christians, consider their faith. Consider not only what Scripture teaches us, the faith that is believed, but they consider their own faith. What do I really believe? What do I really believe? The word consider is an appropriate word to use. I do believe that Joseph looked at the big picture as much as possible. He considered Mary's feelings. He put others into the story, thinking about his family, thinking about the consequences, thinking about the community. He did weigh those consequences, and ultimately, because Matthew describes him as righteous, I do believe he thought about his faith. Maybe not as deeply as he should have. And maybe he didn't go back through all those verses I shared with you but he probably wrestled with this idea of the Messiah and concluded, it just can't be now. It just can't be me. So his plan was to be a, a nice husband and quietly divorce and dismiss Mary and send her away. The Jewish law said she could have been stoned if it was genuinely adultery. But I also believe, after looking at that word considered, that it's not nearly strong enough and I looked at a bunch of translations looking for what I thought the root of the word was. And the message, if you've read it, comes close in this case. It says, while he was trying to figure a way out. You see, Joseph was stuck. In his mind, there were no good solutions. 
I finally came across Paul Meyer, who is a historian, writing about this episode. And although he doesn't give us a specific translation of Matthew's text, I think he gets the word right. This is what he says. But Mary's pregnancy was cruel and shopping, shocking news to Joseph, for he knew that he was not the father. Probably he could not really believe Mary's story of the angelic visit, so he had to agonize over a decision. I think that's the right word. This consideration was agony. Joseph was wrestling with the death of his dreams, the death of his belief system, especially the belief system in a woman that he trusted so much. A woman that I think you can argue from Scripture, everyone would agree, was a faithful woman. A woman who kept in step with the Holy Spirit. A woman who took every thought captive to the Lord Jesus Christ, to her Lord. Those are phrases from the New Testament describing God's people. Joseph was in agony. Could Mary, the one that he thought she knew, not really be the Mary he thought she was? So when we consider this Christmas account, we realize that like Joseph, if we truly consider it, it also carries with it some risk. We realize that life is not as easy or simple as we would like it. I mean, nothing wrong happened here. Joseph is the victim of righteousness and holiness and God's divine action. And even under those circumstances, life can be very difficult. And this is why I think a lot of Christians, and mostly non-Christians, they know about the word Christmas. They don't all know about what it's really about. But they tangentially kind of deal with this risk by watching movies like Die Hard. Is that really a Christmas movie? Well, as I think about it, it's probably easier to watch Die Hard than deal with the blunt reality of the Incarnation. Dealing with the genuine Jesus and risking crucifying yourself, which is kind of what Christians do. They take up the cross and follow Jesus. If you and I truly consider Christmas, we go through that same agony about, is my worldview God's worldview? Is what I am doing in step with what God wants me to do? Sometimes our preconceptions come crashing down. I had a very recent conversation with a graduate student who's Christian. And he was having a conversation with three other graduate students. One was atheist, one was Hindu, and one was Muslim. And no, this is not a joke. They really were having this conversation, a serious conversation. They were considering Christ, considering Christmas. And the other three men, they were all men, joined up against the Christian in the unified belief that they did not need a savior. They believed that they could ethically evolve enough and mature in a moral way so that it would appease whatever divine construction there may be out there. Doesn't surprise me, knowing that some elite academics think that way, whether they are graduate students or undergraduates or sometimes chaplains. But the heart of Christianity and Christmas is not about ethical evolution or achievement. It's about redemption, rescue, and a relationship. That's why Joseph and Mary really can't take any pride in Jesus. I mean, they're all passive in this thing. She conceives by the Holy Spirit. He's told what to do. And before they even get a moment to take a breath after the birth. Who shows up but some shepherds? And then from the sky, angels saying glory to God in the highest. They are worshiping Jesus. He's now achieved all that he needs to achieve because God's word will not return void. He's going to go to that cross. He's going to rise from the dead. Christianity delivers this Christmas gift in full, in entirety. There has been a Savior born for you. God did the work. And he had faithful people to come along for the ride. And as we consider Christmas, it had to be a divine incarnation. Satan is strong. 
Sin is killing people. But God is stronger. You see, the accuser, the one who will expose those graduate students, and God who ultimately at the Day of Atonement will take every mask off our face and off our heart and off our mind and say, am I there? Do I find myself by the gift of faith that I so wanted to give to you? That's what Christmas is about. So as we think about this promise, the promise that he would call him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins, who are his people? Well, if you're listening to the epistle reading tonight, see how great the love the Father has bestowed on us. Love is from God, and everyone who loves has been born from God. John elsewhere says we are the children of God. It's too fantastic to be true. Our minds, when we wrestle with it, say, it can't be for me. It can't be really God in the flesh. But it is. Considerate Christians do look at the big picture. We do consider the feelings of others, and we also consider our actions or inactions. And the most considerate Christians realize that it's about faith, not about works, and it's just about trusting God and his word. If you think about it, when Joseph took his own path, what did he have? Division, divorce, depression, hopelessness. But when he listened to God, when he trusted the word of the angel, what did he have? He was empowered by faith. He wasn't afraid any longer. Do not be afraid to take her. And he was surprised by the wonderful way that the story actually corresponded precisely with what Mary said. And then he also had the wonderful greeting of the shepherds. And Simeon, who picked him up in the temple and sang a song about Jesus, and the Magi, who migrated with precious gifts at the right time for his own trip to Egypt. When we walk by faith, it's amazing the way God astonishes us. In the end, it re we realize that God has the biggest picture. God is really the one who's been considering this all along from the days of eternity. He is the considerate one. That's why Jesus his name Jesus. He sent Jesus himself to save us. Consider that. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which goes beyond what we understand, stand guard of our hearts and minds to keep us strong in Jesus our Savior. Amen. We rise and we sing the uh, offertory hymn, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear, hymn 366, uh, verses 1 and 4. It is on page 5, also in your bulletin.
time we gather your offerings and prayers, if you have a prayer request for the worship service, fill out the orange card in front of you and give it to the children. If it's a private prayer request for myself or the elders of the prayer chain, fill it at the back of that card and drop it in the box as you leave tonight. You may be seated. <laughs> We pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Christmas is a miracle. You can't truly explain miracles, but there are so many. Creation, redemption, the resurrection. But your word speaks about these things, Lord. And then things that we cannot see help us to trust your word. As we all wrestle and consider what the faith means for us, especially Christmas, May you speak to us and may your word have its way with us as Christ comes into our heart and finds its cradle. Bless us, Lord, that we consider Christ tonight. In your name we pray, amen. We have a couple of prayer requests. As I mentioned at the beginning of our service, uh, Jeannie Franson, uh, one of our longtime members, has been uh, struggling with a... Uh, situation with a cancer diagnosis, and uh, her daughter Mary came, and she sings beautifully, and uh, Jean is having a bad day, and so Mary started to say with her as she asked for prayers. So we're praying for Jean Franson. Also, um, a prayer for Vivian Wheaton, who uh, just found out right now is going to have uh, additional surgery on her knee, it sounds like, and so we will be praying for Vivian um, this next Thursday is the surgery. Let's rise for these prayers in the Lord's Prayer. Lord God Almighty, we give you thanks that just as Christ was conceived by the Holy Spirit, it is the Holy Spirit that brings the new birth that Jesus spoke of in John 3. That means that God lives in us by the gift of faith, and you have promised us that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength in this life and will one day raise us up from the grave to live ever and ever with him. We pray, Lord, your blessing for all the saints. We especially pray for Jeannie as she struggles with uh, many difficult symptoms right now. Give her strength in her body 
uh, give guidance uh, the, to those who uh, care for her medically and also to marry her daughter, give them both strength uh, and discernment. We pray for Vivian Wheaton, who has had surgery and apparently will need more surgery on her knee. Uh, we pray that you would guide her as she goes through this uh, additional surgery. Uh, may it be um, successful, and if it is to fix uh, whatever was not right, may it repair that. We ask these things in the name of Christ and pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We gather our hearts together and profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. It's on page 6 in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Most of you should have received a candle when you came in. If you did not, there are some additional candles in the back. You may grab one. We are now going to have the acolytes light the candles after we light the Christ candle and uh, sing our closing medley. So let me light the Christ candle first, then we have the benediction and our closing medley. Peace. 